studies at Fulbright University. Also the person who is running the second season of uh, The World Beyond a Book uh, at uh, Fulbright University Vietnam. Uh, and we are starting again uh, this semester, just as we ended the last season, <laughs> season one, a very successful one with, uh, as you know, somebody who requires no introduction, Professor Christopher Gosha, who is one of the absolute uh, you know, most <laughs> famous and most uh, wonderful uh, scholars and friends, uh, you know, in, in, um, in the field of Vietnam studies. And uh, I'm just so honored uh, to have you come back uh, and join us today, Professor Gosha. Chris. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's really is an honor. It's a pleasure to be back after after last season. I hope I can live up to your expectations there. So uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. And you know, uh, I think everyone, a lot of people watched the the uh, the talk uh, live last time on Zoom on Facebook, and many more uh, watched the recording on Facebook. So I think people were very very much well educated about you know the the lives of the three kings, the three colonial mm. kings of the late French Empire, Bao Dai of Vietnam, who many people know, uh, uh, Sihanouk of Cambodia, and also Mohammed V of Morocco. And in that comparative uh, perspective, um, and uh, today we go back to the first <laughs> in the China where we go, um, but but this time uh, it actually is a book that has already uh, been published by Professor Christopher Gosha. So let me just uh, introduce that in a moment, but also just a, a quick word of welcome to all of you back to this wonderful series. We are having a slightly reduced schedule this year. We're going to just have seven talks per semester, but don't worry, they're going to be some very amazing, amazing talks. Uh, I just want to um, give you a quick sort of preview of what we have in store for you this semester. So uh, after this uh, really cool talk online uh, with Professor Gosha, uh, uh, the next person on our full lineup is going to be on November 1st, Professor uh, Chen Dit Nhung at uh, University of Toronto will be talking uh, about her new book that's about to be released, uh, which is called uh, Tentative Title, Releasing the Soul, Decolonial Approaches to Gender Catholicism, Property in Vietnamese Histories, Actually, I think that title has been recently changed, but but uh, she's definitely going to talk about uh, Catholic uh, history, women and property in, 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 in Vietnam. So that's going to be really interesting. Um, and that will be a, a live talk uh, on the Fulbright campus with lunch included. Mm. Uh, mm. So please, please do come November 1st uh, at 1130 uh, a.m. Um, uh, in classroom three, I believe, on the on the uh, ground floor, in the first floor. Yeah. And then the other speakers, uh, November 10th, uh, Lee Hayslip, uh, the author of When Heaven and Earth Changed Places and Child War Women of Peace. Uh, November uh, 17th, uh, uh, our own visiting professor, Sean Fear, on, uh, from uh, Lee's University on Theaters of Diplomacy, Domestic Politics and Civil Society in U.S. South Vietnamese Relations. 1967 to 1971. Again, uh, that title may change a little bit, uh, but it's going to be his, his new book uh, coming out. Um, and then November 24th, I will be presenting on uh, a, a, an edited volume that I participated in uh, alongside the editors, uh, Matt Galway, Mark Opper, and uh, another friend of mine, Do Ziu Hui, who uh, we both wrote chapters on Vietnamese politics. Um, and it's called Experiments with Marxism, Leninism in Cold War Southeast Asia. It, just came out with Australian University Press, uh, uh, Australian National University Press. And if you know ANU Press, you know every book is open source. So go to their website and check it out for free. Um, December 1st, Wu Lam's new book on public diplomacy in Vietnam. And finally, uh, on December 13th, Isabel Muller, Con Gái của Chim Phượng Hoàng, the daughter of the Phoenix, a, a wonderful uh, uh, novel about uh, Vietnamese German lives. So uh, really exciting lineup uh, this semester, but without further ado, you know, uh, I want to introduce the star of the show, this time the person who's opening for us, uh, this time Professor Christopher Gosha, uh, who is a professor of international relations and history at l'Université du Québec à Montréal, published in 2022, The Road to the Advent for a History of the First Vietnam War by Princeton University Press. And his other books include 
the must read, the textbook uh, of Vietnamese history, uh, Vietnam, A New History, Basic Books 2016, and the Historical Dictionary of the Indochina War, uh, 1945 to 54, an international and interdisciplinary approach by University of Hawaii Press 2012. He received his undergraduate degree from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service and his PhD from L'Ecole Pratique de Haute Etude, La Sorbonne. And this talk, um, in this talk, uh, we'll talk about this, this topic uh, on, on this book. On May 7th, 1954, when the bullets stopped and the air stilled in Viet Bien Phu, there was no doubt that Vietnam could fight a mighty colonial power and win, not like a guerrilla tiger, but as a modern conventional army, a war elephant. After nearly a decade of struggle, a nation forged in the crucible of war had achieved a victory undreamed of by any other nation, national liberation movement. In his famous critique of colonialism, the wretched of the earth, Franz Fanon asked how the Vietnamese had been able to generate such revolutionary violence to win. In his conference, uh, Christopher Grosser will try to answer that question. Nationalism was important, but it was not the only ingredient that explains how Ho Chi Minh turned a ragtag guerrilla army into a modern fighting force capable of bringing down the French army, a feat no other war of decolonization has ever duplicated. So, um, you know, <laughs> amazing topic, amazing book. Uh, and without further ado, Professor Gosher, floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Huang. Uh, the, well, the pressure's really on now as I put the, the screen on here for with my PowerPoint. Uh, uh, and here you have the title, which you've just announced. I'm just going to expand the screen. There we go. Uh, so yes, again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Huang. Thank you to the Fulbright University for uh, having me back a second time uh, to talk about uh, the road to Dien Bien Phu, my new my new book that came out in uh, March of 2022. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, the road to Dien Bien Phu, uh, Ho Chi Minh, and the First Indochina War between 1945 and 1954. I'd like to start, if you don't mind, with a, with a few pictures. Um, and I want to start at the end. I want to start on the 7th of May, 1954. It's in the afternoon. Uh, and here you have the road, a very arduous road, as the uh, professional soldiers of the People's Army of Vietnam uh, make their way up to uh, the top of a, a French post, which they've, they've taken here to wave the, the, flag, the flag, excuse me, what I believe to be the flag of the Democratic Republic. Uh, uh, um, uh, so this captures right away the end game. I want to try to understand what's going on here. Hope I have a little bit of trouble. There we go. There we go. Uh, just, I know... Most of you are in Vietnam. You're all familiar with Vietnam. Just let us situate the, the place and the name where it is in northwestern Vietnam today, uh, west of Hanoi in the highlands uh, and in the Thailands, if I can put it that way, the ethnically Thailands of uh, northwestern Vietnam. Uh, Dien Bien Phu, as you know, is not too far from Laos. It's very near the border, but as well as very close to China. Uh, and it's linked by 1954 to Kaobang, which you see in the northeast on the right hand side here as well. Uh, so you, you can see where the place is. So the, the end of the road here, uh, the victory, this is where the battle takes place between the 13th of March and the 7th of May, 1954. It's a 56-day battle. I'll talk a little bit more about it uh, as we move uh, along here. Um, here, I just want to show you this. This is the one of the assaults, one of the waves uh, that occurs in March and April. There's three in all. But you can see the professional army uh, that's attacking in the open, in the valley, as artillery uh, opens up in front of them to soften up, if I can put it that way, uh, the French position. So in all, there's about 50 to 60,000 Vietnamese professional troops with 250,000 uh, civilian logistics uh, people helping out in the background to bring ammunition, to bring medicine, to bring food uh, to the to the soldiers who are going to be fighting the battle against the French and their Vietnamese uh, allies as well. Here's a picture of uh, the fortress uh, that the French are trying to defend. Uh, as you can see here, they're in trenches because the artillery is falling on them. You can see that you have what I would assume to be maybe French soldiers from metropolitan France. You have uh, African soldiers from Senegal, from uh, Algeria, for example. And of course, you have Vietnamese who are fighting with the French against uh, the communist-led Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Uh, in the uh, the form of the Associated State of Vietnam. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but you have what is a very conventional battle here. You have troops attacking a set-piece position. This is a set-piece position. 
uh, with artillery being fired from each side, there's you know machine guns, uh, some of the things that we see going on in Ukraine today. This is a conventional battle. This is not, I repeat, this is not a guerrilla battle. Guerrillas do not fight trench warfare. This is a, a photo that was taken after the Battle of Dien Bien Phu ended in the defeat of the French Shin, uh, and Imperial troops, um, which uh, French Union troops whom you just saw in the last photo here. It's been cleaned up. It must have been taken sometime in July or August or September of 1954. My point here in opening is to show you that this is a unique battle uh, that the Vietnamese People's Army won. This is trench warfare, which reminded some of the French officers commanding of Verdun uh, during the First World War. And that's obviously not a bad comparison because when you use artillery, and you can see it in Ukraine today, you have to dig trenches uh, in order to protect your men uh, and women uh, from artillery fire. Another photo I'd like to show you is that this made the, the Tour du Monde, if you like, uh, the news of the fall of Dien Bien Phu in France and elsewhere. I just give you three examples here. On the far left, you have the uh, French Communist Party and their paper, L'Humanité, which announces the fall of Dien Bien Phu, uh, as you can see on the upper left-hand corner. On the bottom towards the right, you have the Le Figaro, which is a center right uh, <clears throat> paper in France, which exists to this day, as does Humanity, uh, which also announced the fall uh, of the French as in they represented as, as, as a sacrifice uh, by the French soldiers who had held out uh, valiantly against the, against the, the Vietnamese, and, and, and they did fight until the end. The one that really interests me here is the one in the upper right-hand corner. Orana is a city in Algeria, what was then in 1954 French Algeria. And you can see that uh, the French living in Algeria were closely following what was going on uh, because uh, it concerned them. And as you may or may not know, uh, the Algerian War, the French, uh, France's second war of decolonization, started uh, two months or three months right after the fall of Dien Bien Phu in November of 1954. And the French would fight against the, the National Liberation Front, Front, which is the Front de Libération Nationale, FLN, as we know it by its acronym in French. Uh, the Algerian nationalists would fight them until 1962 when Algeria would uh, gain its independence. I, I show you this, though, because, yes, the French in Indochina were following, I'm uh, sorry, the French in Algeria what were following what was going on in Indochina at Dien Bien Phu, but so were the uh, Algerian nationalists. So let me give you two examples. One here is Ferhat Abbas, uh, a very famous uh, Algerian nationalist, reformist. Uh, in his earlier days, he reminds us a lot more of Fan uh, He was willing to work with the French uh, to reform Algeria, to go towards eventual independence. He would be disappointed by the French, as would Fan Tuching and others uh, in Indochina, and he would eventually join uh, the FLN, what would become the Republic of Algeria in 1962, and he would become the president, the first president of the Republic of Algeria. My point here is that the FLN was closely watching what was going on uh, in Indochina, and in particular, at Dien Bien Phu. I'm not going to read this excerpt that you have before you here, but you can see that Abbas compared it to Valmy, which was a major victory French Republican revolutionaries won against the Prussians, for example, uh, in the late 18th, um, 18th century. Uh, but my point here is that the, the Algerians were closely following what was going on as much as the French and other people in the international community. But the one who really interests me here is Franz Fanon. You must know him if you don't. Uh, it would be worth reading The Wretched of the Earth, a very famous uh, reflection on uh, colonialism, anti-colonialism, and the role of violence uh, in uh, undoing empire, in particular, the French empire. And Fanon, right before his death, he published The Wretched of the Earth, in which he has some interesting things uh, that he talks about, about Dien Bien Phu. I've underlined them here. I don't want to read them. Uh, but he, he, he asked, we're in 1961, and the Algerians really do not dominate the military terrain like the Vietnamese uh, had before them. And he's closely following what's going on here because uh, Fanon is very interested in the question of revolutionary violence and how do you make it? How do you use force? And in a way, France Fanon, who was also, even though he was a, a Martiniquais, he was part of the FLN. Uh, he was part of the Algerian nationalist movement. He was similar, I would say, to Fan Boi Chao in Vietnam. He was one of the first to raise the question, revolutionary violence. It's not enough just to reform. If the French do not want to give us independence, then we may have to take it. So you have this question, what must be done to bring about another Dien Bien Phu? How can we manage it? 
Uh, the only problem was how best to use the forces at their disposal, how to organize them, and when to bring them into action. I have to be honest with you, this question is the one which I want to answer today. Uh, it's also the one which is at the center of my book. I was very interested by this question that Fanon raised in 1961, and I wanted to try to understand, well, what was it that made this victory at Dien Bien Phu so unique? How were the Vietnamese... Uh, in the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, led by Ho Chi Minh, capable of doing this. Uh, so I'm going to go back in time and space a little bit uh, in order to maybe try to explain why this was a victory like none other in the history of decolonization. But I think what's important, as I say here, is how did Ho do it? And what was the price he and his people paid for it? Uh, I'm going to talk about the development of a specific war type of what I call war communism. I'm going to do it in four acts, uh, but this is my response to Fanon, uh, uh, to the question that he asked in The Wretched of the Earth, and to the question he specifically asked about the victory at, at Dien Bien Phu in 1954, which represented, represented for him this amazing mobilization of violence, of force, of revolutionary violence and force that was capable of beating uh, a Western professional army in set peace battle in 1954. Uh, no other war of liberation was able to do it. Um, I'm going to try to explain why the Vietnamese were again and what the cost of that was. I'm going to do it in four acts with a little, a little historical context. I'm then going to turn to the Indochina War uh, in two sub acts, if you don't mind from 1945 to 1950, and then the internationalization of the war from 1950 to 1954. The third act, I'm gonna zoom in on the how. Uh, and in the final act, uh, I'm gonna talk about what price, what was the social price of this type of war? Uh, something which Fanon didn't ask. He wanted to know how to do it. He wanted the recipe. Uh, he wanted uh, to, to, to know how we could do a Dien Bien Phu in Algeria. Uh, but I also want to take up the question of what's the price when you go down that road, when you go down that road to Dien Bien Phu in a time of decolonization. Now, I know everybody in the, the group here uh, this evening, you, you know the history of Vietnam really well. I just want to remind you that you do have this S-like shape uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, sorry, where Vietnam is at the crossroads of Southeast Asia. Uh, and China. Vietnam looks out into the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. It looks south and southwest uh, to Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean. But I'd also like you just to take a little look here in the middle. Uh, Vietnam also looks to the north. Of course, the Chinese colonized uh, Vietnam for a century until the Vietnamese obtained their, their independence in the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, if you like. Uh, but that, 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 that photo there, that map in the middle is interesting for me for some things I want to develop uh, in, the, in, the, in the 20th century. And that is, is that Vietnam is also linked to this Eurasian continent that you see. And we don't normally think of Vietnam being linked to the continent like that. But it's going to be very important for some of the things I'm going to talk about for a kind of a, a Sino-Soviet Eurasian communist toolbox for war that I'm going to talk about. But Vietnam is linked, obviously, to China. Uh, but China is linked as well early on uh, to the rest of Eurasia, Western Eurasia. I'm not going to do a history course here. You don't need this. You know this. But just remember, the Mongols knocked at the northern Vietnamese door, uh, oh gosh, 13th and 14th centuries. Uh, they knocked because that part of the world that you see there was linked. So Vietnam is linked by the ocean to the Pacific Ocean. It's linked to Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean uh, by the west. But it's also linked by northern overland routes to China, Russia, what would become Russia, and eventually the Soviet Union. Take a look here on the left. I think it's important. I'm not going to go into detail in this in my talk, but Vietnam obviously is a colonial creation. It was part of the Chinese empire, but once liberated from the Chinese empire, a lot like the America, if you like, it will become uh, a, an empire itself, and it will move southward uh, at the expense of the Chams, at the expense of the Cambodians. Uh, until you know the, uh, the the 19th century, uh, when after a, a civil war, as you know, uh, Zalom will unify the country in that S-like form that you see here. So just a little bit of uh, context here, uh, but I do want to that it's that middle middle one here, the middle map that kind of interests me here is that keep in mind that Vietnam was linked northwards to China and then via China uh, to the rest of Eurasia. Uh, so 
th those connections are there and they never went away. Even though the French would come, they would leave the Atlantic, they would cross the Indian Ocean uh, with the British and with the Dutch. We know this in the 19th century, they would conquer and create col colonial states in the Dutch uh, uh, Indies, Indonesia, British Burma, British India. <clears throat> and of course the Americans would cross the Pacific as their empire expanded from the 13 colonies in the east to California and then on to the Philippines, uh, for example. So we move from one empire to another. The one that interests me here, of course, is a quick word on the creation of French Indochina during the circuit second half of the 19th century, during the second empire, during the third republic. I won't go into details. You know these details anyways. You can see them in the map. The French will carve out a new colonial state. Uh, so Vietnam, the Vietnamese empire, will be incorporated into a French Indochinese uh, empire. The north is Tonkin, the center is Annam, the south is Cochin China, Cochin Xin, and together with Laos and Cambodia, they constitute uh, French Indochina from the late 1880s uh, until Dien Bien Phu, when that whole edifice is going to come crumbling uh, down, falling down. Now, I want to take a look here. Obviously, I'm, I'm moving towards this idea of explaining the victory and uh, this idea of war communism, which I want to develop. So I'm going to have to concentrate in my talk here more on the communist side. But I think it's important to just evoke here that there's different types of Vietnamese resistance. On the far right hand side, you easily recognize Phan Chu Ching, as I said, a lot like Farah Tabas in Algeria. He will see a contract. He will see a contract with the French, the possibility of modernizing Vietnam while marching with the French towards eventual independence. He also will discover, as uh, others have, have shown, uh, Republican ideas, uh, which he would like to uh, develop in Vietnam. He would be disappointed. We know that, but he didn't know that at the time. On the far left, you also have a Republican, but a Republican Vietnamese nationalist, uh, Phan Bo Châu, who was interested, who, who embraced at least at the beginning the idea of violence, that the, the Vietnamese had to develop revolutionary violence in order to uh, secure their independence, in order to create a republic like uh, Sun Yat-sen in China, for example. Uh, another example uh, that emerges uh, from this uh, by the 1920s and early 1930s is the Vietnamese Nationalist Party, uh, led by Nguyen Pai Hoc, whom you see here. Uh, he creates this nationalist party of a Republican design. Uh, he is not uh, a communist. He rejects communism and he embraces democracy, I would say, in a form of republicanism. You have revolts uh, that occur uh, by, led by the nationalist party in the early 1930s. They would be crushed by the French. So obviously, I, my, my, my goal here is not to, to give you a, a history lesson, which you all know very well, but it's to move on to here. And I have to in order to explain what's going to happen during the first Indochina war and to explain that in game at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. So it's Ho Chi Minh. You know him well. He leaves uh, Vietnam uh, in the early 1910s. He will go to France. Uh, he will be present during the First World War in Europe. He will cross the Atlantic uh, to the US to um, uh, Great Britain as well, uh, uh, but he will turn his back on reformism. He will turn his back on the French. He will turn his back too on republicanism. Uh, he will not embrace democracy and he will embrace instead uh, Marxist-Leninism, uh, which he discovers in France. You can see it in the photo, the third from the left. Uh, well, he's a member of the French Communist Party. Uh, he was instrumental in its founding and he was very involved in colonial questions. So he embraces uh, Marxist Leninism. I'm not going to go into that. I think you all know that very well. Uh, what's interesting, though, here, and I think we forget it, is that uh, yes, he traveled across the Atlantic. Yes, he was very interested in French ideas, uh, but he was also interested in these very transnational ideas, which would be uh, based out of the Soviet Union, uh, which was formally created after the Civil War in 1922. Uh, and, <clears throat> and Ho Chi Minh will travel to Moscow. He will spend time there. He will train there. He will meet people. I'm not going to give you names of these people that you see in the middle photograph here. Uh, he will learn Russian. Uh, he will study methods of communist organization of uh, war communism. The word war communism comes from Lenin, uh, and it was uh, instrumental in creating the, the communist victory in the Soviet Union. 
uh, between 1919 and let's just say 1922 when the Soviet Union uh, came into being officially uh, when the uh, the anti-communists were defeated he would he would go <clears throat> then to southern China as you know as a member of the Comintern he would work closely with Chinese communists for example Chou Enlai uh, he would come back to the Soviet Union he would study uh, in, uh, in in political institutions in the Soviet Union. Uh, and in the late 1930s, when the Second World War breaks out in Asia in 1937, he will return uh, to China. He will visit Yan'an. Yan'an is in northern China, and that is where the Chinese Communist Party, led by Mao, by Mao Zedong, would begin building a revolutionary army and a revolutionary state, which eventually would take power in China in 1930. 49. You have a photo on the far right-hand corner of Ho Chi Minh with the future general Zhu Dei, and uh, who was the, the head of the People's Army of China, uh, I believe, until 1949. I could be wrong about that. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. But anyways, my point here is that Ho Chi Minh was moving through what I call a Eurasian revolutionary trajectory, uh, which left Paris, where you see Ho Chi Minh in the middle photo, and reached all the way to southern China and to Yunnan and back to southern China by 1940 as the Second World War accelerated. And Ho Chi Minh is running this corridor. He's a part of this corridor. He's a member of this world. Are there problems? Sure. Is he accepted by everybody? No. But he knows the people, especially in China, but also in the Soviet Union, and he knows the techniques, the techniques for building uh, military revolutionary armies and for building states, consolidating power. I'm going to come back to those in a moment, but I'm preparing the, the, the ground a little bit here, is that there is this revolutionary arc that moves from northern Vietnam to the Soviet Union uh, through China, for example. And that's important to keep in mind for reasons I hope you'll see pretty soon. Before we get there, a quick word on World War II, because that changes uh, everything. Obviously, that's the case across all of Eurasia, but it's uh, the case, of course, in East Asia, Southeast Asia, as you can see here, as the Japanese expand their empire by persuasion and then in particular by force when they invade China in 1937. And then in 1941 and 1942, they attack the Americans in Hawaii before turning their attention towards Southeast Asia, where they will overthrow the Americans in the Philippines, the Dutch in Indonesia, uh, <clears throat> the British in Burma, Singapore, uh, but they will coexist with the French uh, in Indochina until 1945. I don't want to go into too many details here, but they coexist with the French because France falls, as you know, in 1940. Uh, the Republic, the Third Republic is replaced by a government that collaborates with the Nazis and therefore by extension with the, the German allies, the Japanese. Uh, and therefore, there's a unique situation where the French collaborate in Indochina with the Japanese. It's complicated. I don't want to talk about it here. Uh, but what is important is that as we get towards the end of the Second World War uh, in Europe, uh, France is liberated by the Allies, and that leads the Japanese to overthrow the French in Indochina. They're afraid that the French in Indochina would now join the resistance against them. And that's key. That's key. Uh, because the French Indo-Chinese colonial state, of which I spoke briefly a moment ago, uh, that had existed for 80 years, exists no more from March of 1945. A few months later, in August of 1945, the Japanese Empire, which you see in this map here, which existed from 1937, or if you like, we can go back to the Meiji period in the late 19th century, uh, is no more because uh, the Japanese, after the two nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they capitulate, uh, and it's the end of the Japanese Empire, and it's the end of the Second World War. What is important here is that Ho Chi Minh, nationalist, but also a communist, he created, I didn't mention a moment ago, but I think you saw it in the PowerPoint, he created the Vietnamese Communist Party or the Indo-Chinese Communist Party. Uh, he will cross the border uh, and push the arc, if you allow me to put it that way, a little bit further into northern Vietnam. Uh, much like the Hucks were doing in the Philippines, uh, the Chinese, uh, the Malayan Communist Party was doing in Malaya, taking advantage of uh, the war in order to build up armies and nationalist fronts that could take power once 
uh, the Japanese would be defeated, which everybody was betting on. They didn't know it would come in August, but they were betting that it was coming. So you have a photo here on the left. It's a very famous photo. It's Valwan Zap who creates the Liberation Army in 1944. That is the, the start of the People's Army of Vietnam, the one which you saw that took Dien Bien Phu on the 7th of May, 1954. But it started off, I think it's not pejorative to say this, as a ragtag team of guerrillas uh, who started to come together to organize themselves in order to take power. So army is formed in 1944. A nationalist front is formed in 1941, uh, and following the Japanese defeat on the 15th of August, you know it, uh, the Viet Minh take power uh, on the 19th of August in the north, and then in the center, and then briefly uh, in the south. That brings me to my second act, and we're going to move now into the Indochina War. Uh, in few words about the, the period which is marked by guerrilla warfare between 1945 and 1950. And then I want to concentrate uh, on this transition um, to a conventional army, a professional army uh, that's able to fight uh, conventional set piece battles uh, between 1950 and 1954. So briefly here, uh, we know what happens on the 2nd of September 1945 uh, before the French can return and before the Allies uh, really uh, can return. Uh, Ho Chi Minh declares uh, the birth of a new nation state uh, in the place of the colonial state that had existed before. It's the birth of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Uh, so you have Ho Chi Minh on the left, very famous photo. You know that with his government that he sets up with a ministry, uh, you have it in the middle here. And you have symbolically, I like this, the imprint of uh, Vietnam, Doc Lop Tu Zo Hang Phu, that's imprinted on top of the, the, the the pre-existing state, which is no longer there. The problem is, is that France, the new France, born of the Second World War, like Ho Chi Minh's new Vietnam, born of the Second World War, uh, is now in power. But the new France, the national state created by Charles de Gaulle, who you see right here, who had also been circulating on the outside of France during the Second World War until the Allies liberated France and allowed uh, Charles de Gaulle to come back to, to, to take power in France uh, at the head of a new French state, uh, what will eventually become the Fourth Republic. Charles de Gaulle wants that new nation state to remain an empire state, an imperial state. The empire must come back, as that, uh, that propaganda uh, poster shows here, must come back to the empire, and it must come back to the state. For Charles de Gaulle, there's really no compromise to be made with, the, with Ho Chi Minh on independence. We can talk about this more in the question and answer period if you want, but there's a real contradiction. Are there negotiations between the French and the Vietnamese in 1945 and 1946 as French troops debark in southern Vietnam in October of 1945? Yes. Uh, is there a, an attempt by the Vietnamese? Ho Chi Minh, you see him here on the right. As the Chinese pull out, they were sent, the Chinese of Chiang Kai-shek were sent to northern Vietnam at the end of the war to receive the Japanese surrender of the British to the south. Uh, as they pulled out, Ho Chi Minh did try to negotiate, uh, but it was inevitable, in my opinion, that war would break out. There was two diametrically opposed conceptions of the political future of Vietnam. Uh, so you have war that breaks out in southern Vietnam in September of 1945, and then in December of 1946, a year and a half later, despite attempts uh, to negotiate some sort of a peaceful decolonization, uh, their backs against the wall, uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, goes to war. He attacks the French in Hanoi, and it's the outbreak of the First Indochina War on the 19th of December, 1946. Uh, so you will have, and I treat this in one of my chapters in my book, uh, you have the Battle of Hanoi, you have the Battle of Saigon, you have the Battle of Hue as well. Uh, the Vietnamese will have to abandon, they lose the Battle of Hanoi, and they will set up their new uh, capital in the northern hills of Vietnam, looking down uh, onto the, the Red River Delta here. But this is the start of what I call the first phase, the first period. It's the guerrilla war period between 1945, 46, if you will, and 1950. You've seen this citation before you. Uh, this is what Ho Chi Minh told an American journalist in September of 1946, uh, when the journalist questioned the ability of the Vietnamese to win against the conventional French army coming out of the Second World War. 
Uh, you can see here that Ho Chi Minh, in a very famous uh, metaphor, compares the guerrilla army to a tiger, the French army, a modern army, uh, to uh, an elephant. Uh, and he explains that the tiger will never uh, attack frontally. He will attack by night. He will attack in the jungle. He will, the idea is to bog down the, the elephant and eventually tire the elephant out and kill it if possible or force the elephant to withdraw from Indochina, uh, if you like. Um, so this does indeed uh, characterize the nature of guerrilla warfare in Algeria in the Indonesian Republican War against the Dutch, which breaks out at the same time as the, the first Indochina War, and of course uh, here in in, uh, in Vietnam as well. So you again you have this picture of Vong Nguyen Zap said uh, developing the the, the people's uh, um, I'm sorry uh, the, uh, the 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 core the start of the Vietnamese army. Now, this is important in my book here. This period between 45 and 1950 is important. Uh, is it a guerrilla war? Yes. Is it hit and run attacks? Yes. But the Vietnamese led by Ho Chi Minh from Northern Vietnam are doing some very important things. Uh, if you look at these photos that I've chosen here, uh, they're important, I think. And I have chapters which cover each of them. Uh, for example, the Vietnamese create a war state. The Democratic Republic of Vietnam carries on. It is more than just a national front. It has ministries for the different types of uh, governance that it's doing. This photo that you have of Ho Chi Minh with his typewriter, well, this is important for one of my chapters because I show that keeping this war state alive, what was important as well was keeping the bureaucracy alive, was contesting the French. When they would move into certain zones with their people, the Vietnamese would push back with theirs. So I have a chapter on bureaucracy, the war bureaucracy. I have a chapter on economics, war economics, what I call trickle economics. And you can see this by the national money uh, that you have here on the right-hand side. I have a chapter on radios as well and the importance of radios. Uh, why were they important? Well, they were important because they helped to hold together what was in reality an archipelago state. So when the Vietnamese pull out of Hue, when they pull out of Saigon, when they pull out of Hanoi and go into the countryside, um, they do not control all of Vietnam, nor do the French control all of Vietnam. And this is something that I develop in my book, is that you have the birth of an archipelago state, you have a shattered state, uh, but it has to be connected. And the Vietnamese connected with bureaucrats, they connected with mailmen, with male women, they connected with radios as well. Uh, and you can see the male people here on the left-hand side trying to connect this shattered state. So if you look at this map, this map is from 1950-51. It's a little bit more consolidated than it was during the period before 1950. But you have the capital in the north, in the, in the northern zone. You also have this zone, if you look at my arrow here, in central, uh, central Vietnam, upper central Vietnam, south of Hanoi. And you even have what's called Zone 5, which reaches into southern central Vietnam. And then shattered parts uh, are less controlled in the south, as Sean McHale has showed, it's much more contested in the south than it is in the center and the north here. So you have uh, what's a shattered state of war, uh, the French control zones uh, and the DRV control, control zones. But what's interesting here is the degree to which the Vietnamese, like the FLN in Algeria, like the Indonesians uh, fighting the Dutch in Indonesia, have to hold the guerrilla state together. So there's more than just guerrillas fighting against elephants and this sort of things. There's bureaucrats involved in this, there's radio operators, and there's people on the ground uh, trading uh, illegally with the cities in order to keep this war state up and alive so that so that it can be there. No one knew the Chinese were going to win in 1949, 1950, but Ho Chi Minh and his um, and, and his uh, allies were uh, determined to keep it alive uh, as long as they could. I'm going to turn now to the second part of part two, uh, the second part of the second act. Uh, it's the Chinese Communist victory in October of 1949 and the consolidation of this overland Eurasian arc uh, that's going to come into being again from 1950. Uh, and it's going to play a very important role in the victory of the Vietnamese communists uh, in 1954. Of course, the photo that you see here, this is in the 1960s. I agree. I couldn't find a photograph of Mao Zedong and Ho Chi Minh in 1950. Uh, but you can see here that Ho is a part of this wider communist uh, world in which he had been circulating uh, since the 1920s. 
So you have the consolidation of this arc. You can see it here as the Chinese communists move in 1948 southwards uh, towards southern China, Canton, Guangzhou, uh, and towards the Vietnamese border, as you can see here. And then eventually in 1950, they'll take um, the, the rest of what we see, what we call China today, uh, Tibet, for example, uh, and the Northwest uh, here. But this is, if I show you this, it's the birth of the People's Republic of China in 1949 and 50, but it's also this contributes directly to the consolidation of this arc, which is linked to the Soviet Union, which you can see in this photo as well. Uh, and that's important uh, because that will open up uh, aid, uh, military aid. It opens up uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of things that will start to flow through it all the way until 1975. It will also draw the attention of the Americans. So this is the internationalization of the first Indochina War. Uh, you have an internationalization which is never really matched uh, in the Dutch Indonesian War. I don't think it's matched either in the French Algerian War. Uh, it's matched certainly by the Korean War, which uh, breaks out in 1950 and is linked by the Americans to what's going on in Indochina as part of their domino theory or part of their uh, containment policy that you see here. So just a few points uh, so that we're all on the same wavelength. Uh, Mao Zedong comes to power. He will support the North Korean communists during the during the Korean War against the Americans, he will send in troops uh, to fight the Americans and others in Korea until the end of the Korean War in 1953. Mao Zedong will diplomatically recognize the government of Ho Chi Minh in January of 1950. He will provide uh, military aid, modern aid, artillery, uh, machine guns, anti-aircraft uh, weapons as well to the Vietnamese between 1950 and 1954. He will provide as well economic aid and political aid, about which I'll speak a little bit more uh, in a second. On the other half, on the other side, excuse me, you have the Americans, President Truman, you see him here. He will support uh, uh, the French in Indochina indirectly. He's fighting a direct war in Korea, but he sees Indochina as a key part of containing uh, the spread of this Eurasian communism uh, into the Asia Pacific region, into Southeast Asia. What does he do? He increases diplomatic aid to the French. He recognizes the associated state of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia created by the French in 1949. He recognizes them and others in the Western Bloc recognize these Indochinese states of an associated kind in 1950. The Americans provide increased military aid to the French, lethal aid, which it's, it is just like the aid that, that Mao contributes to Ho Chi Minh. This contributes to the intensification of the violence, the level of violence that would be used during the second half of the Indochina war. You do not see this in Indonesia. You do not see this in Algeria because you do not have these two corridors which are funneling in large amounts of diplomatic but also uh, military aid. So by the end of the Indochina war, as I'm sure you know, the Americans are flipping about 70% of the military bill for the French uh, operations uh, in Indochina, up to and including the Battle of uh, Dien Bien Phu. So uh, I think this is important. We have a unique type of internationalization which takes place uh, in Indochina, which we do not see uh, elsewhere. I don't want to play down the importance of Egypt in terms of helping the Algerians during the war against the French, but the Egyptians led by Nasser did not have the type of weapons uh, or in the, the amount that Mao Zedong and Stalin, uh, the Soviets behind him, were providing to the Koreans, the North Koreans, and that they were pro providing uh, to uh, Ho Chi Minh. So this corridor, this Eurasian corridor is important to explaining why the Vietnamese could pull off uh, a Dien Bien Phu in 1954 and why I'm trying to answer, I'm trying to work my way to answering the question of France Fanon, Re remember, uh, there was no such corridor running uh, to the FLN in Algeria or to the Indonesian Republicans fighting the Dutch uh, to the south of the Vietnamese in, in maritime Southeast Asia. One last thing on this period between 1950 and 54, before I turn to the how, the third act, is that that aid, excuse me, that, that military aid that would come in, 
that that would contribute and that economic aid and that political aid about which I'll speak in a moment that would contribute to the ability of the Vietnamese led by Ho Chi Minh to extend and consolidate their territory, their Vietnam. Uh, if you like that shattered archipelago state in the north and in the center and in the south center began to consolidate as the Vietnamese were able to uh, project more military power and to use that military power to extend to extend their bureaucratic control over people and space. That would not be the case in the South, which would remain, as Sean has shown, which would remain in a shattered archipelago situation, I would say, until the obviously until the end of the first Indochina War and even thereafter. We can come back to that in the question and answer period if you like. Uh, if you look here, the Americans helped the French, and they helped the French consolidate their hold over the South, but also over the Red River Delta, which is a major rice producing area. And Ho Chi Minh, and he, he, he wanted access to that part of Vietnam. He would be defeated in set peace battles in 1951. That, and that's my second point with the second map that you see here, that would force the Vietnamese to start looking to the West. So I'm trying to prepare the ground a little bit to explain why the Vietnamese turned to Dien Bien Phu. One reason is because they couldn't take the, 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 the Northern Delta. That doesn't mean that they gave up on the Northern Delta. And I'll talk about this a little bit more later on when I talk about food, because the main rice growing areas are in for, for the DRV in the center and in the North, they're in that Red River Delta. That explains why the Vietnamese wanted to take the Delta in 1951, and they would continue to try to take it. But, but I won't go into too many details. In the end, they would have to turn west to fight the battle, and in particular, the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in the highlands. But so what you have is a transformation because of this Chinese communist aid. You have a transformation of the archipelago into a more consolidated sickle-like shape, which you see here. I kind of exaggerated it in this map. It would also allow the French to consolidate their hold on the south, but also on the northern delta uh, here. So I'm going to try to move down the road to Dien Bien Phu from 1950 to 1954. This is my third act. I want to get at the question of how. How did the Vietnamese do this? How were they able to move from kind of a ragtag team of guerrilla fighters to a professional army that was able to bring down the French uh, uh, at Dien Bien Phu in 1954? First thing that's important is the Chinese were important. Uh, the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party, Mao Zedong in particular, uh, would assign great importance to helping Ho Chi Minh, whom he knew, in whom he had trust. And then he would send, as you all know, a military and political advisory group. Uh, I'll repeat just one last time. This collection of about 200 advisors would play a very important role in helping Ho Chi Minh to transform the tiger into an elephant. They would do it militarily with the military aid that I was telling you about. They would help the Vietnamese using Chinese models, which had worked for them in the late 1930s and during the Civil War against the Japanese and then against the, the, the Chinese nationalists during the Civil War. They would use those models, share those models with uh, Ho Chi Minh here in order to transform, create a, a new type of modern professional army. They would bring Vietnamese troops to southern China to train, safe from French bombing, for example. Don't forget the Ukrainians are doing something similar in American and in British camps as well to increase their ability to use artillery, modern weapons. Something similar is going on here. Ho Chi Minh wants to win. He wants his Democratic Republic to win. He's looking to the Chinese, but he knows those men. I'm not going to give you all the names there. He knows these people because he's been running that corridor since the 1920s, 1930s, uh, and, and up until this period here in the early 1950s. Uh, so you have this military group that works closely with the Vietnamese up to and including uh, Dien Bien Phu. Uh, this should come as no surprise militarily. Again, the Ukrainians are doing something similar in their fight against the Russians today. This is how you create something new. This is how you take a tiger and you transform it into an elephant. But that takes serious models, serious training of a military kind. 
this advisor group working with the Vietnamese will proceed. I'm trying to get at the how now. Uh, they will contribute to two types of revolution. It's a joint exercise, uh, but it's an important one. The first is a military revolution. Here's a list of some of the things that we can talk about in more detail later. But there's a real military revolution that occurs in a time of decolonization, which has no equivalent in Algeria or in Indonesia. First element that's important, it's the artillery, it's the anti-aircraft, uh, it's the training of uh, Vietnamese troops in Vietnam and in China. It's the creation in 1950 of the People's Army of Vietnam, a professional army consisting of seven divisions. Guerrilla armies do not create divisions. They don't create artillery divisions. By 1953, the Vietnamese have an artillery divisions. Guerrilla armies, they don't create professional armies uh, numbering 200,000 who move independently of villages. That's what this does. So when we talk about those eight conventional battles that you see in point number five below, from Kaobang to the Indian Fu, the army, the professional army that you see in this photograph here in front of Ho Chi Minh is moving across uh, large expanses of territory uh, from the northern border to southern to, to areas in central Vietnam. So that's the second important point is the creation of this military revolution. It's the creation of the People's Army of Vietnam. Uh, sorry, there's a two in the two there. They go together, excuse me. And a professional divisional army equipped with modern equipment uh, that you see here. Something that's forgotten, I think, too, is that the Vietnamese decreed mass mobilization of the population. Mass mobilization of the population in early of 1950. That allowed the Vietnamese state to justify juridically the mobilization of people at the local level within their territories, at the village level, at their territories. Uh, they obligate them to participate in uh, human logistics um, groups, uh, providing food, giving rice, all sorts of things. You have a military conscription, the draft, the military draft, which is opposed in late 1949, something which the Ukrainians did at the start of the war with, uh, with Russia at the beginning of this year. Ho Chi Minh did it in 1949. He was preparing for what was coming already before the Chinese took power. Uh, a draft, if you don't go into the army, you can be court-martialed. You can be, you know, you, you can have serious problems here. Uh, you also have the beginning of conventional battles at Kaobang. I can give you other examples. Uh, guerrilla warfare continues, but is now uh, joined by conventional battles at the same time in northern Vietnam and as well, more and more, in central Vietnam as well. That last point is important here, uh, and this is something that I try to argue in my book, is that there was a state. There was a state that existed between 45 and 1950. It was a state that was remarkably modern for all those reasons I talked about, radios, communications, linking, bureaucracy, uh, economy. It, it was weak. It was scattered. Uh, but it was in a position to, once the Chinese came with their aid, it was in a position to transform that aid into revolutionary force into a military force. I'm trying to answer Franz Fanon's question that I told you when he said, how did they do this? How did they create that violence? They had to have a state behind it as well. It was not enough just to have the Chinese, the Soviets, whoever, just give you a bunch of artillery, as you can see here in the photo on the right. If you don't know how to calibrate artillery, if you don't know how to transport it, if you don't know how to feed your troops, then you will not get an elephant. You will remain at the tiger stage, if I can put it that way. It's not pejorative, but this is an important point that I, I try to develop in my book, is that there was a state. It was not a communist state. It was going to become one. Uh, it was led by a communist party, unlike in Algeria, unlike in Indonesia. But this state that Ho Chi Minh was able to put together between 45 and 54 was able to take in hand this military, economic, and political ed and models and to transform it into something else. So you have the revolution, the military revolution. I think you also have a political revolution. And this is something that I think is important. It didn't really happen that much before 1950, but with the Chinese behind them, with the Soviets behind them now, uh, Ho Chi Minh adopts the, the Eurasian model, a uh, revolutionary communist model, if you like, that comes out of the Soviet Union, a form of war communism. I'll get to that in a moment, which dates back to Lenin and the Soviet Union right after World War I, uh, which will be developed by Mao Zedong, different forms, different methods of building statecraft, communist statecraft, and fighting modern 
war in a communist way, if I can put it that way, which Mao Zedong would develop as well. Here's a list. I'm not going to repeat them all here. Um, I think you know some of them. We can certainly go into more detail about them. But the first thing is that the Communist Party from 1950, the Vietnamese Communist Party, will extend, expand its control over the state and the army with Chinese assistance, advice, and models. Uh, they will increase their control, the Communist Party, using the army, using the police as well over the nationalist fronts that they had created, which they didn't necessarily have the majority in, but now they will take them over. The Viet Minh, other type of women's associations, peasants associations, they want to consolidate their hold over the police and over the army uh, with the creation of cadres, commissaires, and all sorts of things. How do they do that? They do it with the rectification of the party, the army, and the police, and the bureaucracy. Uh, this is a specific uh, communist method, this idea of perfection. That's what the Soviets called it in the 1920s and 30s. Rectification is what Mao Zedong called it as he developed it in Yan'an in the late 1930s, and then during the war against the Japanese and the Chinese nationalists uh, during the 1940s. A rectification of the ideological thinking of the party, army, police, and bureaucracy via intensive indoctrination of officers, soldiers, and civil servants under party control. The idea is to percolate down by, by persuasion, by force as well, uh, new men, new women who are, how would I say, uh, uh, they, they, they've been formed, they've been indoctrinated uh, in the party's thinking. That is what's called the correct party line. There's words for this in Vietnamese and Chinese and in Russian. Uh, but it's a form of ideological control. It's a desire on the part of the party. Uh, Mao did it, the Soviets did it as well, to homogenize the bureaucracy, uh, uh, to homogenize the intellectual class in order to be able to control them uh, better and more efficiently. Uh, so that's another example. Patriotic emulation campaigns. These exist in Vietnam, as I'm sure many of you know. To this day, they exist uh, in China. They exist to a certain extent even in Russia today. Uh, patriotic em emulation campaigns where you would introduce introduce excuse me a pantheon of heroes uh, around whom you would mobilize the population so you would have a hero for the peasant class you would have a hero for women you would have a hero for engineers and you would organize mass activities at the local level as far down as possible around these people uh, you would try to get everybody to compete to equal what they had done by producing more rice, by, uh, by, by, by joining the army, for example, by producing more weapons in the weapons fa factories, this sort of thing. Uh, so you have this very, this comes from the Soviet Union, uh, these emulation campaigns. These are not Vietnamese creations, they're not Chinese creations, but they were tailored by the Chinese and by the Vietnamese to their local circumstances. The cult of personality, they're gonna, they're gonna launch it. It had been launched already in 45, but the Vietnamese communists will launch this uh, from 1950 around Ho Chi Minh as a source of ideological control, as a way of mobilizing the peasant population. Education comes under the party control, as does propaganda. The last one, it's that's especially uh, from the Maoists and from the Vietnamese. And Ho Chi Minh was very much aware of land reform. The idea that Ho Chi Minh didn't know what land reform was about and that it was imposed by the Chinese, I have a hard time with that. Why? Because he was circulating within this Eurasian revolutionary corridor of which I spoke a moment ago. He knew what was going on uh, in the Soviet Union, but he knew in particular that China, like Vietnam, had a majority, uh, uh, an overwhelming majority of peasants, and that the Chinese, like the Vietnamese Communist Party, had to find ways to mobilize the peasant population to participate in the conventional war that was now heating up uh, and to, uh, to participate in the emergence of this single party communist state, which is clearly coming into being with this political revolution in statecraft I'm talking about right here. So land reform, it does two things. It does a lot more, but there's two things that uh, that's important here. It helps the party up above overthrow the feudal class, the, the landowning class, in order to take it into hand themselves, in order to uh, consolidate their control over the peasant majority population. And by giving land, taking it from the feudalists, taking it from the landlords, and giving it to the peasants, the idea is that this will mobilize them, this will lead them to want to participate uh, in the war here. What's going on in these seven or eight points that I'm developing in this political revolution here is that from 1950, Ho Chi Minh has access to a Sino-Soviet communist toolbox. 
for state making on the one hand, but also for war making on the other. And it's this combination of the political and the military revolution at the same time, which, which constitutes a form of war communism as Lenin defined it uh, in 1919, 1920, and 1921 and implemented it at that time. Was Ho Chi Minh aware? Uh, did he use the word war communism? I haven't seen the word itself used, but Ho Chi Minh arrived in the Soviet Union, uh, if I'm not wrong, in 1923. And he spent time there, he came back, he was trained in the Soviet Union. He knew about these tools. He knew about these methods. He knew about these arms and other people in his party knew about them. Uh, I think this is important, this photo here, there's, there's a shared toolbox that's going on here. It's not like the Chinese imposed this on the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese were at ease with it. Uh, and the Vietnamese would take it and they would use it uh, for their own ends. Then they would use parts of it in Laos and Cambodia as well. We can talk about that in the, in the, the question and answers if you want. But it's not like this is some sort of a Chinese imposed um, type of model. The Vietnamese were well aware of it uh, ever since um, Ho Chi Minh left Paris on his way to the Soviet Union. So this is two types, two type, two, two revolutions, a political and a military that go hand in hand and they constitute what I'm calling the Sino-Soviet communist toolbox or a form of war communism, which you will not and cannot find in Republican Indonesia during the war against the Dutch, nor can you find it in the Algerian revolution war against the French because neither one of those national liberation movements and or states was directed by a communist party. It matters. So here you have some uh, photos just to, to give you an idea of what these tools are. You have the cult of personality around Ho Chi Minh, around his birthday, uh, the idea of associating people as far down the social ladder as possible via propaganda, via newspapers. On the right-hand side, you have the National Patriotic Immigration Campaign in 1952, as if by accident. This is when the war, the conventional war is heating up. The Vietnamese Communist Party needs people for the army. It needs people for the bureaucracy like never before. It needs hundreds of thousands of people to man the logistical operations uh, to bring food, weapons to the army that is moving all around northern and central Vietnam. This is one way of doing it. Whether you agree or not, it doesn't matter. This is part of the toolbox that's being used. And this National Patriotic Tidua em emulation campaigns are a part of this. The creation of um, a new man, of a new woman. Uh, this is a, a citation that comes from Benoit de Tréglaudet uh, in his book that he published oh, 15 or 20 years ago. But I think he really puts his finger on something important in this citation that you have here. I'm not going to read it, but the underlying parts are for me what's important is that these emulation campaigns, this new man, which we can find in the Soviet Union and in China, they're designed with military and political goals in mind to mobilize the members of a collective behind the exemplary models of new and virtuous figures. This amounted to impressive ideological control. The new man, new woman as well, rapidly became a successful idea for a government that was looking to root its political legitimacy among the population. They would do that by force when the army marched in, but they had to move in politically as well. They move in with the bureaucrats, but they're going to move in now as well with cadres, with the party. Far from a philosophical abstraction, what he means by that is this new hero emulation, new man, new women. It's, it's more than just fun and games. This is very real stuff. It's a very real method that's been used in the Soviet Union, and it's been used in China, and the Vietnamese are applying it now on a more widespread way. And you can see it helps create a so-called heroic bureaucracy of men and women capable of reinforcing the structure of the state under the increasing control of the Communist Party. So there's a there's a slow moving, I'm sorry to say it, but there's a coup d'etat which is going on here. The state which existed from 45 to 50 was, yes, it was run by Ho and the Communist Party, but they never had the type of control that they would be able to assert from 1950 to 1954 not only militarily, not only diplomatically, but on the ground by certain methods that allowed them to take into hand uh, people uh, and, and territory. 
So I'm not going to name these people here. I just want to remind you that this is part of a bigger toolbox. It didn't come from the French Communist Party. It didn't come from France, uh, at least not directly. These things came from this kind of Eurasian arc, uh, which was developed by the Soviets and then by the Chinese. And then the Vietnamese helped develop it as well. They are part of it. Uh, it was not imposed. Uh, they chose it. Again, they chose rectification that you can see uh, in 1952 in the middle here the rectification uh, led by Ho Chi Minh of cadres, of a bureaucracy. Uh, on the left, on the upper left-hand corner here, you have the emulation campaigns, 1952, in the middle of this second stage of the war, moving towards an intensive conventional war, uh, but mobilizing in order to have more people that the party can control, in order to mobilize them more effectively for this conventional type of warfare that they're doing. On the upper right, upper left hand, uh, lower left hand corners, you have land reform. This started in earnest, and it's not an accident. In 1953, it will go uh, into 1954. As you know, it will eventually stop in 1956. But land reform was designed and timed uh, in 1953 uh, with the move towards DMB and food, the move towards a massive, almost total mobilization of the, the of the people within the DRV in order to bring down the French at DMV and Fu. You see something similar going on in China during the Korean War between 1950 and 1953. Chen Jian, uh, a specialist of China and Mao's China at Cornell University, I think, maybe he's somewhere else. Anyways, he has written about this. You see something similar being used here. Uh, the idea is that we mobilize we apply land reform as a part of the war, as a way of pushing through land reform, but as a way also of recruiting people we need for the war itself. So I make my way uh, towards Dien Bien Phu in 1953 uh, and 1954. I'm trying to explain the attack that you see here with artillery with a professional army, three divisions, not all the divisions, but the, the different regiments from divisions of the seven divisions are here. Uh, you have Ho Chi Minh, you don't have the Chinese here, they were there as well, but Ho Chi Minh and his team are quite capable of uh, running this type of battle as the Chinese had been able to do it as well in the late 1940s against the, the nationalists. They're quite capable of doing it against the, the French as well. So they're gonna go for broke. And the French are going to go for broke as well. Each is convinced that they have to beat the other uh, before there's any sort of negotiations that can take place in Dien Bien Phu. I'm uh, simplifying here in a big way, uh, but I not really want to talk about, I don't want to talk about the, the end of the war diplomatically. I want to talk about how and why the Vietnamese could pull off this amazing battle in 1954. But if you look at this, I tried to find a way to present this PowerPoint here. The decision is made in, in 1953, and in particular in late 1953, to go for it. When the Vietnamese, Ho Chi Minh, the Chinese as well, saw that the French were willing to fight a set peace battle in the highlands, uh, close to China, close enough that they could send more military weapons that were coming now that the Korean War was over, that were coming to, to, to Vietnam, they were, they, were ready, they were ready to go for it here. But what's interesting here is that I, I developed this in the last chapter of my book, is that you cannot divorce the decision to implement land reform in 53 and 54 from the decision to go for broke at Dien Bien Phu. Uh, land reform was a weapon. Land reform was part of this total war that the Vietnamese were willing to, to, to undertake in order to bring down the French and their uh, army at Dien Bien Phu uh, in May of 1953. Uh, so when we get to this point here, it is true that you have a tiger now that can fight like an elephant. Uh, it, it was it was it was an incredibly I think it was a gamble, but but, but that tiger did indeed. Uh, whether you agree with that tiger or not, it does not matter. That tiger was able to bring down and set peace battle, uh, the, uh, fighting as an elephant. It was able to bring down the French uh, during that siege of fifty six days. Nowhere. Will you ever see a DNB and Fu repeated? Not in Algeria, not in Indonesia, not in ISIS, not in Al Qaeda. Uh, never. It's the only war of decolonization in the 20th century where that occurred. And I think, though, there are uh, areas where there were similar battles like this that occurred during this time. It was during the Korean War, 
it was during the Chinese war against the Japanese and against the Chinese nationalists. So I'm trying to answer again, Fonce Fanon's question, what's going on here? How did you guys do this? And I'm trying to say there was a military revolution, there was a political revolution, and there was an opening of a corridor, which the Algerians did not have. Again, I am not belittling the importance of Nasser's Egypt, um, but he could not provide the type of modern weapons with the Chinese and then with behind them the Soviets uh, could provide. So you will never see trench warfare in any other war of decolonization because those weapons never got there. Had the Algerians had artillery, believe me, trenches would have to be dug quite quickly. I'm going to turn now, Huang, sorry, <clears throat> Huang, if, it's, if, if I have maybe 10 minutes left. Uh, sure, I sure, just, no worries. Is that okay? All right, okay. I hope that's clear for everybody, and I'm, I don't want to just kind of carry on here. I just now looked at my watch, but uh, okay. Let me just take talk a little bit about the final act. So you've seen uh, this uh, coming into being of kind of a Eurasian war communism, but at what price? And I think that's important. This total social mobilization I've been talking about. Well, it came at a huge social price for the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, not for the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, but for the people, the civilians, for the soldiers as well of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Why? Because until Dien Bien Phu, there was, there was no mechanized logistics. There was no trucks. I don't want to get into military details too much, but the Ukrainians have trucks. They have it. If they didn't have trucks, then they would have been already obligated to mobilize the population, civilian population, even more so than they did now. In Vietnam, as in China, even in the Soviet Union during the Second World War, uh, Ho Chi Minh had to mobilize the population to carry rice, to carry weapons, not artillery, but to push it at least up to the Dien Phu. In this photo here, these uh, are civilians who have been drafted because of that general mobilization law I talked about a moment ago to push the bicycles loaded with medicines to Dien Bien Phu. So that's the road to Dien Bien Phu that you see here as well. On the right hand side, I don't know who this man is. I don't really know what he's thinking about. It could be a woman. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But it captures this idea of exhaustion. Between 1950 and 1954, the Vietnamese Communist Party mobilized around 1.6 million people, civilians, women, and men. As a matter of fact, half of them were women. The idea that women, Vietnamese women, were not involved in the Indochina War is, is absurd. They were deeply involved in the Indochina War. Uh, were they working as nurses? Yes, but they were also working in these uh, logistics teams, human logistics teams doing grueling work. Um, so in order to, how would I say, in order to supply these set piece battles, eight and all between 1950 and 54, the Vietnamese had to mobilize the population like never before. Nothing of the sort, this type of social mobilization occurred in Algeria. I don't minimize it. It's just for the reasons I'm trying to outline here, you do not have this mobilization and this massive exhaustion of the population, men, women, civilians combined. A few more. Uh, they would have to repair roads, bridges, dikes bombed out by the French, supplied by the Americans with B-26s and heavy firepower, napalm as well. Um, so mobilization of the population, because there's no trucks, what we call mechanized logistics. There were some by 1953, but until then it was very limited. Another problem was food. If you create a professional army with seven divisions that are no longer living off the land, you have to feed them. Not only do you have to have logistics people who can bring them rice, you have to have a peasant population that can produce the rice. An army to cite Napoleon that cannot eat does not fight. Uh, and the Vietnamese, it's very interesting, the Communist Party was very much aware of the problem of rice. They called it the power of the rice general, uh, Tung Gao, uh, that you can see here. And they were very much aware of the problem of if you go for broke like this, be very careful because feeding 200 to 250,000 soldiers, that eats up a lot of rice. An elephant, unlike a tiger, eats a heck of a lot of rice, um, other things as well, but rice in particular. So that's a, a big problem. It's a big problem too, because the French were well aware of this and the French intentionally unleashed an economic war against the Vietnamese from 1950, even in the South in 1949, but with the internationalization of the war from 1950, 
the French turned their attention to central, lower central, and above all, northern Vietnam in an attempt to bomb their economic installations, not only uh, their, their weapons, their arms, their arms manufacturing plants and those sorts of things, but they bomb dikes, they bomb uh, dams, uh, they go into the fields as you can see here, that's not, a, that, that is a very accurate, that's 1954 right here, they go into the Red River Delta and other deltas in order to deny the Vietnamese the ability to sneak in, if you want to put it that way, their people and take the rice out as they had tried to do uh, from 1950 and 1951. Uh, the French, I think this is important, they, they, they bomb, they sabotage, they want to starve uh, the elephant uh, so that it cannot turn into something modern and dangerous as had been the case in China, as had been the case, and they had seen this in North Korea during the Korean War as well. These photos I think are brilliant. Uh, you can see here we're in the Red River Delta, we're south in Nam Ding, we're south of Hanoi here. It's the, uh, I don't know which re harvest season it is. It's, it's probably the April, May one, if I'm not wrong. Correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but you have the French soldier carefully watching. You have a property owner, a landowner here, bringing the rice out and getting it to the market as quickly as possible. And here you literally have French soldiers, excuse the pun, going into the field. Literally, this is part of the war. They're doing this. We see similar things going on in Ukraine right now, folks. Uh, so this is this is this is not new that's going on, and I could give you examples from before the Indochina War, but this this is really important because food, as others uh, in Vietnamese studies have shown, really started to become scarce uh, by 1952, 1953, and 1954 uh, because that elephant, that Vietnamese elephant, was starting to eat up a lot of food, and the Vietnamese people were having a harder and harder time producing it not least of all because the French were bombing, strategically bombing. So famine starts to break out by 1953 and 54. You can, see, you can understand why in a way Ho Chi Minh, another reason why he unleashed land reform in 53 or 54 was because of the economic war that the French backed by the Americans uh, unleashed on him here. So that, that's an important thing, which I don't think uh, has been studied enough. I think there's a lot to be done. If there's anybody out there who wants to work on either the French or Vietnamese side, there's a lot to be done on these kind of non-military sides, which are linked to military and political sides as well. Uh, so you have the question of rice. I mean, there's a book to be written on rice and war. You have General Chassam, who was a commander of the French Air Force between, let's just say in the early 1950s, but he, uh, he is very gung-ho uh, on the economic warfare. He's very gung-ho on bombing. He's very gung-ho on bombing water buffalo populations as well. And the French did indeed bomb water buffalo. The Americans weren't the first to do it. The, the French did it as well. And I can give you all sorts of other examples in the history of warfare, but let's not go down that road. I'm not gonna, he, he, he has a quote here from, he's, he, he's talking about Algeria and he's relying upon the French Indochina uh, example here, and he's he's urging the French uh, in this citation at the bottom here. He's urging the French military class in Paris to adopt an economic war against the Algerians, like he did against the Vietnamese. I'll translate quickly. You have to starve them to death. I'm convinced that had we killed all the water buffalo in Vietnam, had we destroyed the rice in Indochina, we would have had the Vietnamese at our at their throats at our mercy whenever we would have wanted it. It's a rough translation, but I believe that's accurate here. I'm just trying to show you here that this type of war that starts in 1950 is very different from the war between 1945 and 1950, and it's very different from the type of wars in Indonesia or in uh, Algeria or in other wars of decolonization. The French bomb. They bomb before the Americans, and they bomb with napalm. Uh, so those, um, the, the battles, Dien Bien Phu and other battles, the French are unloading American napalm that was being used against North Koreans and Chinese during the, the Korean War. The French would bomb with napalm and bomb with all sorts of other things. They had B-26s from the Americans. Um, I think it's important because this rendered, you see, I think maybe where I'm going with this, this also rendered the French Indochina War, the second half of it, the single most violent war of decolonization in the 20th century. There is no way, uh, because this war never developed in the same way in Algeria or in Indonesia or in other places, but here, this war in Indochina resembles much more what's going on in Korea. So I'm again, I'm trying to answer France Fanon. I'm trying to say maybe there's different types of war going on here 
uh, and we need to be not just compare Algeria with the Vietnamese case, but we need to look at what's going on in that Eurasian, Eurasian arc I've been talking about. These are from the, the so-called American War. Um, I have recently, I didn't have time to include them, but we're starting to get people working on what the French were doing. The French have gotten something of a pass, uh, maybe because of the, the American War, uh, on the type of war that they raged against the Vietnamese between 50 and 54. Uh, so if I'm being I'm trying to be a little bit honest about what the Vietnamese communists did, I'm trying to be a little bit honest here as well about the, what the French colonialists were doing as well between 1950 and 1954. So to bring things to a close here, please forgive me for being a little bit long. My response to Fanon, whom I respect enormously, especially his ideas on revolutionary violence, is that war communism, Vietnamese war communism, Eurasian war communism generates modern revolutionary violence uh, capable of bringing down Western, if you want to put it that way, armies uh, in China, North Korea, and Vietnam. Uh, but this, this model was not duplicated elsewhere uh, in the decolonizing world, and therefore we don't find, to my knowledge, any other GMB and foos uh, that were fought. I would just want to go back to one thing. Again, it's important. Don't forget that the Indonesian Republicans, they were just as nationalist as the Vietnamese communists, just as nationalist as the Vietnamese anti-communists, but they had different types of states that developed during their wars of decolonization. And again, they did not have access to the corridor like the North Koreans did, like the Chinese communists did, and like the Vietnamese communists did, access to the type of arms uh, which create uh, such revolutionary violence, which impressed France Fanon in 1961. I would just like to end by saying that I'm working a little bit on this, but between 500,000 and 1 million Vietnamese died during the first Indochina War. I think it's probably closer to 500,000. I don't want to get in the idea of like, you know, trying to up the numbers or minimize the numbers, but the Vietnamese sources that I have access to recently and some French sources would suggest that 500,000 is, is closer to the truth. It's just that Bernard Fall, a French historian, and Bernard Fall, love him or not, I, I personally respect him greatly. When he comes up with a number, he usually knows what he's talking about. And he's the one who came up with that number of 1 million Vietnamese. I don't know where he got it, but if I, if I say that, if someone can help me out to find out where he got that number of a million, I guess I'm also suggesting I'd maybe like the Vietnamese to release the numbers if possible. Anyways, it was a glorious victory, but it was also the most violent war of decolonization in the 20th century, costing the lives of 500,000 Vietnamese mainly civilians, uh, women and men, uh, but also troops as well. Is nationalism important? You're going to say, well, go show, why didn't you talk about nationalism? It is important. It's very important. Um, it's important in Ukraine today. I would never say that the Ukrainians, you know, the, the nationalism that's driving the Ukrainians today is not important. It is. I would never say that the nationalism driving Ho Chi Minh was not important. It was. The only problem is, is when you get down to the nitty gritty of this type of military history, if I can put it that way, with social dynamics in it, nationalism is important, but it can only shape, it can't explain the outcome like DNB and Fu. I think that Zelensky would agree with me. I think Ho Chi Minh would agree with me. I think anti-communists would agree with me that nationalism is important. Anti-communists could be nationalist. Communists could be nationalism. Nationalists, there's no problem there. But at the same time, you can only win wars on the battlefield when you have certain things. And one of those things is a certain type of state. And the other type of thing is you have to have a professional army with modern weapons. If you want to do a DMV in full, if you want to... Uh, push back the Russians in eastern Ukraine today, and you also have to have access to a corridor. I think you would agree to me with me that Zelensky has access to a corridor and is vitally important. I'm going to stop there. I and those are some of the things that I, I take up in my book that you see here. If ever these ideas or others may be of interest. Um, you can find them in my recently published book, The Road to the Indian Fu, A History of the First War for Vietnam. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Professor Gosha. And, you know, um, 
the, it is a fascinating book. Uh, you can find it on Amazon and, and elsewhere, ma many places, uh, or order a physical copy. I really, really recommend it because it's just a book that has so much, so much in it. Um, I just, I have, uh, I had some questions, so, um, and then some comments, but uh, in the interest of time, I understand that our IT team sure. and sorry about that. Uh, I'm communications, sorry. no worries. I, I think we were all just really enjoying it so much. I know that they they are in in the university right now physically, and they need to um, get uh, going home in in about uh, I understand uh, uh, eighteen minutes. So so uh, <laughs> the best way to do this is uh, I'll just say a few things that immediately crossed my mind as I as I went through this. First of all, I think the, um, some of the things you you didn't mention in in this talk that I think are, are really fascinating, um, just the role of people like they did talk. Right. Um, the, the, the idea which I, you know, he, he had a long political life and I think you revealed some, some things in here about his role in organizing um, in the South and in the North that um, I think I'd never seen anywhere before really, really worth um, looking at. I think um, really changed some of my ideas on him. Um, even this idea of, of the Viet Minh being disbanded and folded into the Lien Viet group. Um, that's yeah. also something that I think like, Almost every source, you know, right, just talks about the Viet Minh as as the Viet Minh um, to, uh, throughout. And and uh, again, it's it, uh, some of these refinements to to the history are are incredibly um, incredibly useful. Uh, but I think the biggest comment, the biggest sort of takeaway um, mm. uh, out of all of this for me is, you know, um, you know, there are some official historians in Vietnam who have you know, various problems with your uh, Vietnam history. <laughs> and, you know, that that's completely fine. I, uh, you know, differences uh, among historians mm -hmm. uh, exist. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just have this feeling like they'll all be super happy with this new book. It, it, it almost seems like, you know, a lot of what you say sort of comes full circle and in a way confirms many of the things that some of the history, the official historians um, actually mm -hmm. Quite like and like to say, you know. So, so that I think puts you maybe in in a very <laughs> interesting positionality. I think you realize this, right? Uh, with with uh, sort of the rest of the 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 sort of Western historiography that that maybe uh, uh, you know on this issue you're, you're a bit closer to the to the communist uh, official historians. Um, mm -hmm. and, and and you even joke a little bit in some parts of the book, like, oh, you know, please don't uh, throw away the book yet. <laughs> Just hear me out. Uh, but but yeah, definitely a, a really amazing book about so communist organization, communist state building, and so on. Uh, uh, please feel free to respond to that uh, a, 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 as you like. But I also just want to direct your attention uh, to the questions that are in the mm -hmm. chat. Now mm -hmm. I could uh, read them out quickly, sure. or it would would it just be faster if you deal with them and and just sort of uh, s summarize them and deal with them. Or, What's the best right. way? Okay, to... I, I just pulled them up here. I, I, I pulled them up. Yeah. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I got to be honest, I, I let the, the dice roll to, to your third, your third point. Um, I think you know me well, um, I let the dice roll wherever it may. Uh, in other words, I, I follow my ideas to where they lead me. And I think you would agree, maybe others as well, I have no problem uh, bashing heads, um, you know, with certain, you know, Kind of orthodoxies um uh so yeah i mean certain so some people like what i say at one time some people like it and then they're kind of oh i can't believe you said that and then oh you're bashing the french you know and then uh, now right now for example in french in france um a lot of french on the colonial side are really coming at me pretty hard um so all i can say is if i'm kind of annoying a lot of people i know it's kind of a wimpy answer but if i'm annoying a lot of people then you know i must be doing my my historical job correctly i would like to just say though one of the big arguments in the book though uh, you know i did focus on the victory of the Indian fool and that is the glorious thing as well so I, I get it i got it but there's also the argument here is that the the communists they engineered a they they engineered a coup d'etat so i get back to what you said about le duc Tal, about the Viet Minh. it wasn't all that strong they knew it and they were worried about that they were worried that the state might get out of control on them uh, and in a way, it was thanks to this, this, this internationalization of the war that they were able to take in hand the state and to control it. And it's what I call that slow burning coup d'etat, uh, which came into being. And that's how the communists uh, took power 
1954, but in 1950, if you like. Um, but we can we can we can talk more about that if you like, or others can contact me. But um, yeah. Yeah, the first question here about um, who was in control of the Viet Minh in southern Vietnam, what was the importance of rectification? The thing is, is that 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 sickle shape, that sickle shape, it brought in the army, it brought in uh, weapons, it brought in advisors, but that sickle shape never got to southern Vietnam. And so there was really not that much rectification that went on in the south. At least it wasn't the type of rectification that was kind of the orthodox Sino Vietnamese Ho Chi Minh stamped approval uh, that came from uh, you know the northern part of Vietnam and then was funneled south through the sickle there. Um, so uh, the South will remain a very uh, heterogeneous, a very shattered, a very archipelago. And it's not militarily consolidated because that's where the French are strongest. That's where French Vietnamese allies are strongest as well. The Cao Dai, Hua Hao, Bing Xuyen, and on we go. Sean has showed that. So you don't have the, the degree of rectification of emulation campaigns. That will come later. That will come later. So the mili the bureaucracy as well, it's never that kind of Sino-Vietnamese bureaucracy that will develop in the north and in the center. Yes, the sheer degree of organizational complexity involved in DRV's war communism must have entailed a significant degree of force. Uh, yes, this is true, and there was force. It wasn't all persuasion. They were using the, the, the military and the police uh, in order to force people. I would say that force was never used, and if it, I, I will never, no, I'm not going to say never, but the, 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 the force was increased from 1950. Uh, again, that's very important to my argument when the, the 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 vietnamese communist party really took in hand the police force um the, the military uh, the bureaucracy created this bureaucracy and and pushed it through uh, so i can give you all sorts of uh, examples of using force and resistance to force so this mobilization there's parts of my book where i talk about it there was revolt of course the vietnamese communist party doesn't like to talk about that just like the french revolutionaries don't like to talk about that uh, during the, the french revolutionary wars as well there was peasant revolts against uh, Ho Chi Minh in 1950, all the way until 1954. There was even resistance, uh, you know, in the whole DMB and Fu. And I think, yeah, if you say that I'm kind of giving an official line, well, yes and no, because I didn't mention it, I probably should have, but the exhaustion, the level of social exhaustion was such that in after DMB and Fu, I think this is one of the real reasons that Ho Chi Minh agreed to the Geneva Accords and the division of Vietnam was he was running his people into the ground, either by famine, by exhaustion or by force as well. And he had to back off. If not, he was going to bring down the whole communist temple on his head. So I think that's something that I do bring to light there. And I agree with the, the second question here, the sheer degree of organizational complexity. I would just say that I, you know, I can only give a talk in an hour, an hour and a half, but it wasn't like homogenous all over. It, it remained very scattered, but nonetheless, it happened. And that's the nature of this beast that emerged. Um, in the north and in central parts of Vietnam. You mentioned the mass social mobilization somewhat created a sense of exhaustion. I've just talked about it. Do you think that this exhaustion might have somewhat forced the DRV? That's exactly right. That's what I just said. So the third question there, I think social mobilization that forced that forced uh, Ho Chi Minh, even Chung Ting and others to sign off on the Geneva Accords. Were they under Sino-Soviet pressure? Of course they were, but they were also actors in their own game here. And they knew that if they pushed any further, they were going to have social resistance. They were going to have revolts. They were there. There was there was there was a problem of famine. So I don't think I'm really pushing an official line that much. I'm just trying to explain the the dynamics of what they set in motion between 1945 and 1954. So yes, total agreement uh, with that uh, social exhaustion as one of the elements that went into the convention. It's in my in my. Uh, my conclusion as someone who works on food and empire in a sense i'm very yeah, oh yeah, go ahead uh, sorry sorry yeah chris uh, since we seem to be making pretty good time you're really knocking these uh, questions uh, <laughs> in. uh I, I just like to also uh you know sure. um add because in the book you also uh chris you know obviously talks about uh the the, the weakness of the south compared to the north yes, but chris. also there's this role specifically right of this guy Nguyen Bing who's a fascinating uh, person yep. 
uh, who you know had been uh, sentenced to hard labor alongside the communists for decades, uh, and he worked, worked with them for decades, but decided not, you know, after you know multiple times being offered to join the party, uh, did not join the party, right? Yes. Until he, yeah, and, and until he he got all this. Uh, this accolades from actually leading the uh, military sort of resistance in the north in in his own way, right? When Ho Chi Minh then sends him down south to become the commander of all the south, and then he sort of uh, he does build a, a conventional army. He does take on the French in Absolutely. the fields, and he gets wiped. He gets totally wiped. He does wiped get wiped out. Blood. We have to. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, 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 I mean, I don't want to go overboard here. Um, it's it's not because you're communists that you're all, the only ones who are able to create a conventional army. I mean, look at Ukraine; they're not communists. But um, I think you're you're right to bring up his uh, his example. There is that um, he was able to do it. He got the directions from the north to do it, uh, and he put together a very impressive conventional army based on mainly battalions. He didn't get much further, but nonetheless, what he did was impressive with what he had. Uh, but he got wiped out. But let's not, you know, he got wiped out by the air, the French Air Force. He got wiped out by French artillery. I don't want to go into too many details. But let's not forget that the People's Army of Vietnam took some serious hits as well in the north, too. It's the nature of transitioning from a tiger to an elephant. Because once you fight in the open, that's what the Ukrainians are doing now. And you can get wiped out. The other thing I want to really zoom in on what you said and I think this is something I'm going to push back just slightly, ever so slightly against what you said. I mean, yes, there will be official historians like there's some, everyone's going to like something in my book. Some they're not going to like certain things. That's fine. That's fine. I have no problems with what you said, but there is obviously I I'm, I'm focused on something else in my talk today. So that guides that about which I speak and I leave out other things, but I think it's important to keep in mind that there was a lot of non-communist who went into the DRV in 1945, 46, 47, 48. And they did because they believed in independence. They joined, like many joined the FLN in Algeria. They joined the Indonesians. They wanted independence. They knew that Ho was a communist, but they thought, you know what? Let's just go. The bigger enemy now is the French. We can work this out later. They didn't know that uh, Mao Zedong was going to come to power and you know open up this corridor, send in the advisors, send in these two revolutions I talked about here. But I think this is important, and we're starting to have some really interesting memoirs from the non-communist, anti-communist side that show this period between 45 and 50, that there it's not just the associated state of Vietnam. I think this is important, and I really try to show this in my book. And it gets back to what you said about the Viet Minh. Even within the Viet Minh, there was a lot of nationalist, non-communist, I would even say Republicans and anti-communists. They were like, let's do this, boys and girls. We'll go together. But when Le Duc Tho got to the South and started pushing back, well, you know, the party here, we're the ones really in control. And they're like, no, you're not. No, you're not. So this is, this, this is an important type of thing that I show in the book, is that until 1950, there is a coalition government. And... The communists are not as they're they're not a monopoly yet. They're going to increase it in the north and the south, thanks to all those reasons I just gave. But we've got people who like um, uh, what's his name, uh, a, a Vietnamese nationalist in the Vietnam Wars, Nguyen Phong Luan, I think is his name, Luan. Uh, that's that's an amazing book. I mean, people should read that memoir. I think it's one of the best memoirs I've ever read on the Indochina War, maybe on the Vietnam Wars as well. He and his father joined the DRV. They were in it uh, until 1950 or 54. So I think there's there's a book to be written too about all of these other Vietnamese who were in the DRV. And that's why I say from 50, Ho Chi Minh is going to operate a coup d'etat. It's a slow burning coup d'etat, which, uh, which, which ends uh, in 1954. Uh, so I, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to respond to that persuasion and different things there. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's, it's fascinating, and and I think Lord was also. Uh, I think you you talked about him being. Uh, was he one of the ones involved in the in the international trade as well? I thought that was also a really fascinating yeah. chapter. Um, that that uh, you you talk about all oh, that international trade with with southern China and with Southeast Asia really harkened back to your first book. 
uh, that that True. everyone True. loves so much Thailand and the networks. But I think it, it goes much beyond 1950 as well, which was True. like a, a, a great, uh, I think, addition. So uh, we have just time to for you to answer the, the final question by our own professor, Mark E. Frank. Uh, right. Um, yeah. yes, we need I to know. finish in just four more minutes. So. OK, I know Lizzie Collingham's work, work. Yes, I know Lizzie Collingham's work. She's been very, very influential in my work. Um, I'm, just, I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble reading. The Taste of War, yes, indeed. I cited in my book. I haven't seen the dissertation on colonialism. I would love to see that. Yeah, no, I, there's, there's. I mean, if I can speak to anyone out in the, in the audience today, there's, there's a book to be done on food and uh, food during the Indochina War. There's a book to be done on food during the Vietnam War. Uh, so there's these social sides that I, you know, there's, uh, you know, the, the foreign trade you talked about. I think there's something to be done on that as well. So some of those chapters I have, I think it, someone could run, you know, with any of those chapters and then say that I'm wrong, you know, no problem there, and then write a book. And, and, and I think there's just a lot to be done in many different ways uh, on the, the first Indochina war. Just I see that there's something in Vietnam in 2021. We also have COVID-19 war in Ho Chi Minh City. Yeah, I've had a lot of people tell me about this, and I, I know exactly. I wasn't in Vietnam during COVID, but uh, the patriotic emulation and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I think there's some some. Uh, how would I say some comparisons that could be drawn to the way China and Vietnam has dealt with COVID in terms of some of these uh, these uh, these tools from the the toolbox I've been talking about. Yeah, and on that note, you know, just linking uh, you know the, the, this history back to some of the language that we still hear today yes. in campaigns to some of the things that we can notice the way the Vietnamese government still runs today. I think. Um, it's a really <laughs> fascinating way and, and good way to end the, the, the talk for today. Uh, once again, you know, Professor Gosha, you always bring uh, a party to, to this. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues just said, you know, in a way, Professor Gosha in writing is completely different from Professor Gosha in uh, in talking. So <laughs> I think <laughs> how you will. Um, yeah, you know, really, really. I'm gonna take that uh, as a compliment. I'm gonna take that as a compliment. <laughs> I think, I think, I think. Uh, it, yeah, I think, I think it is. Uh, and same with my comment about how uh, this, the, the the state historians are gonna like you. That that that's not a criticism. I think, no, no, no. I I take it very, very well. Not a problem at all. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it is uh, it is pretty late at uh, in in Vietnam. It's a little yep. in uh, in Singapore, yep. and it is an early happy. Uh, uh, Thursday for you. So thank you, thank you. so much, Professor Gosha, for, for sharing your time, not just one, but two whole talks with us. Um, we've learned so much and you are the perfect person to close our first season. You are the perfect person to open our second season. Uh, thank you so much to the audience. Thank you so much to Fulbright University and all the uh, university leaders, IT team, uh, communications team who, who uh, have helped us so much in in bringing this uh series forward and uh, i will see you guys uh, on tuesday uh the first of november in person classroom uh three i believe uh in uh, one one oh three in on the first floor there will be food free food uh and you can still view that uh that talk online as well by professor chen did uh, uh from university of toronto uh, yeah, we have two talks immediately from from Canadian scholars. Yeah, uh, so go Canada, <laughs> go Canada, and go <laughs> Vietnam, Vietnam studies in Canada. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to you, Huang, and to your team. It's been a great pleasure, um, and I'll see you soon. <laughs> have a good day. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Good evening. Bye.